All right. So we'll uh, carry on from the uh, discussion from last time. So last time, essentially, the moral of the story was the Gardner's invariance theorem, which essentially said, so similarity between self-adjoint spaces, so similarity between uh, self-adjoint subspaces of B of H, let's say, adjoint subspaces of B of H implies unitary similarity between them. In fact, you got a one parameter like group of automorphism, so to say, so unitary, uh, so unitary similarity between those subspaces. Actually, not really a one parameter. You got a two parameter family. So let me remind you the, the last thing that we proved. Uh, yeah. So essentially, if we have T, A, T inverse is equal to B. So T is an invertible operator. Then if you have this polar decomposition, U, H, then what you have is um, H to the Z, A, H to the minus Z is equal to A for all complex numbers Z. So this is a two parameter group of automorphisms, uh, inner automorphisms, I should say. And you have U star B of U is equal to A. So this is a unitary similarity between A and B. And then also on the side, you get a, a large class of inner automorphisms of A. And if you want some sort of star automorphisms, so star preserving automorphisms, then if you choose just the like purely imaginary, then this looks like, so the map which sends, let's say an element A to this element, H to the I T A H minus I T. So this will be a map from this big A, this self-adjoint subspace. This is going to be a star linear map, a star automorphism. So that was the, the, the key idea. And this was a consequence of Gardner's invariance theorem. There were a little like small gaps, but eventually I figured those are, uh, yeah. So, so just let me remind you the gap that we had at the end of the proof of Gardner's invariance theorem, we had an expression of this form, E minus summation nu equals one to K, J nu plus summation nu equals one to K, E to the two pi I S N nu, J nu. So all you need to do here, we were just confused whether the sum of this is real or not. So we don't need to bother with all that. You just look at the algebra, which is, um, so, I mean, it was in some Banach space. I think we had the notation D or something. So if you look at this ideal, this left ideal generated by I minus J nu, and look at a maximal ideal containing this, then this maximal ideal cannot contain J nu. Simply because if it did, then it has one minus J nu, it has J nu to be the full space, right? So any maximal ideals which contains this does not contain J nu. Now look at the Gelfand transform corresponding to that. So then what you would have is rho of J nu is not equal to zero. So in fact, you can choose a, th a thing and these are all orthogonal idempotent. So in a way, instead of just one minus J nu, I can just isolate, let's say nu equals one. So maybe I have J1, J2, JK. So these are all orthogonal to J1. So in fact, one minus J1, so this ideal will contain all of these elements, J2 up to JK. So if I choose nu equals one. So in that case, you have all these sort of delta functions, like in the sense rho of J1 is equal to one, but rest is equal to zero. Uh, rho of J1 yeah, is one uh, and rest are zero. So in that case, I don't really need to th think about sums. You just look uh, like directly at this function. And of course, for all values, unless n nu is equal to zero, for all values of S, this cannot be a real number. So yeah, so that finishes the proof. So it was uh, a small point that we were missing. Okay, so now with this um, general idea of Gardner invariance theorem in mind, we went back to our um, so representation uh, toward the genus representation and the Hilbert space we had in mind was MNC. So to start with, we have this Frobenius norm, but actually we can look at many different, like in every state on MNC we had figured was associated with the density operator. We had explicitly proved it. And the way that works is this is equal to trace of H A. And this in some sort of Frobenius norm, I can think of it as A square root H dot square root H. So this is like a unit vector because square root H dot square root H is in fact equal to one. So in the Frobenius norm, so this is equal to one because trace of H is equal to one. 
So in general, any functional I have on MNC, I'm supposed to think of it that way. This is like a, a vector. That was the conversion of uh, the density operator formalism to a state space formalism. All right. But to start with, we'll just take H is equal to identity. But the, the, the procedure that we're going to talk about will work for any H. In fact, it will be even more interesting when we change H from identity operator to something else. Um, so in fact, like when it's not a tracial state, then we'll have more interesting stuff to talk about. But uh, just to get started, let's do this. And then we had this map from H to H. So this H we're thinking of as MNC in the Hilbert space structure. And we have represented MNC on itself by like some sort of left regular representation by left multiplication. So this map was given by, think of this A as a vector, then this is nothing but A star. So S of A is equal to A star. <clears throat> So the one thing that we had noticed, we have all these multiplier operators, uh, maybe, so this A is a vector, this MA is a multiplier operator, so you have this. So effectively, if you have B, it is sent to A times B. So that is that operator MA. So now, one thing that we had noticed was SMA, S is contained in, so that was the last thing that we had done in the previous lecture, is contained in the commutant of this. Uh, so this is an algebra simply because like uh, it's, it's in fact isomorphic to MNC. You have all these matrices A. Um, okay. And uh, what you notice is S is this and S squared is equal to identity. And S is, I had stressed on this fact that it's a conjugate linear map. It's, it's a conjugate linear map. And you have S squared is identity because first of all, when you apply on A, you get this vector A star. Then you apply again A star star, which is A again. So S square is equal to identity and conjugate linear simply because S of lambda A is lambda bar of A star. And if you add A plus B, then of course S of A plus B is equal to S A plus S B. So how did we prove that? We just explicitly uh, checked whether it commutes with everything in this set. So essentially what we wanted to see is S M A S times M B. So we want to prove this, that M B S M A S. If we prove that, then we have concluded that S M A. So A is fixed here, and B can vary. So B belongs to M N C. So A is fixed here. So what we want to conclude is that this equality holds, and we just directly computed it on all vectors. So every vector kind of looks like a C, and then this is M B acting on C is B times C. So you have M S M A S. B times C, and then this is C star B star, because S just takes it to its uh, adjoint, adjoint in MNC, because we are going to talk about other stars. For example, S star is not the same as C star. So, so that's something one has to keep in mind. So when we do this, it is just a multiplier operator. So A C star B star. Now when I apply A, A here, then I get B C A star. So the end result of this computation is B C A star. Now let's try to do something similar, but on the other expression. So MB times SMAS, I'm evaluating on a vector in H, which is looks like C. Now this MB SMA C star, so S of C is C star. Then I have MB S A C star. Then again, I take star of this, so I have MB C A star, which is B C A star. So we did see that these two are actually same. They evaluate to the same thing. So it proves one direction. It doesn't prove equality. In fact, it shows that S M A S is contained in M A prime. We'll need to do a little bit more work to show the uh, other direction. Yeah. <clears throat> So before that, uh, there's, a, there's a few, so we are going to digress back and forth. So before we, we attempt that proof, I'm, I'm going to kind of draw the analogy that is being built here. So you have R of one diamond algebra. In, instead of that, we have been talking about just MNC. So the one algebra is simple MNC. Of course, you could take direct sums and uh, things will uh, change a little bit uh, if you take direct sums of, uh, of your uh, matrix algebras. But yeah, we are looking at a type one and factor, so-called type one and factor. Okay, so the vector i, so i in H is a cyclic vector for MNC, simply because 
if I want to hit this vector, so this is nothing but MA acting on I. So this is the image of MNC. So as you uh, apply all the operators, if in fact, you recover every element of the Hilbert space. Yeah. So this is a cyclic vector. Now this is also a separating vector for MNC. So why is that a separating vector? Simply because if you say, uh, if M A of I is equal to zero, this simply means A is equal to zero, just by definition. If M A of I is equal to zero, this implies A equals zero, and that is exactly what it means to be a separating vector. So in summary, you have that this I, which will denote it by a U, for example, if you didn't have this tracial state, we'll be talking about uh, square root h here instead. Instead of an i, we'll be talking about square root h. And uh, so in that case, uh, uh, so square root h, the GNS representation, of course, it will be a cyclic vector, but uh, will it be a separating vector? We'll have to see. Okay, but for, for this example, let's just say u equals identity is a, cyclic and separating vector. For MNC. And now this is a general fact about one nine algebras is that any vector which is cyclic for R is actually separating for R prime. So if U is cyclic for R, then it is separating for its commutant. Okay, so here's a quick proof. So let's say you have this operator T prime in R prime. So this is an operator in the commutant. And then let's say, and let's say it's acting on some Hilbert space. So these are all R, R prime, they are acting on H, some Hilbert space H. Then, uh, uh, and let's say xi is that cyclic vector. So cyclic for R. My claim is this xi is separating for R prime. So now I have chosen this and let's say T prime xi is equal to zero. So what I really want to prove is T prime is equal to zero. So T prime xi equals zero, but xi uh, can be approximated. So since xi is cyclic for R, you can write xi as if it is a finite dimensional case, you can actually directly write this is equal to something, but otherwise you can approximate. So cyclic would mean that R of U is actually dense in H. Okay, so you have something like this. You have a sequence of operators Tn so that uh, Yeah, yeah, sorry. For any vector eta, you have this. So for any vector eta in H, you have a sequence of operators Tn such so that this holds. For every eta in H, there exists Tn in R such so that this holds. Now, what can we say about T prime of eta? This is equal to limit of n going to infinity, T prime of Tn xi. So now these two commute, so I can remove this Tn. So limit of n going to infinity, Tn, T prime xi. Now T prime xi by assumption is equal to zero. So hence this is equal to zero. So what we have concluded is that T prime eta equals zero for all eta in the Hilbert space, which implies T prime is equal to zero. So if I have a cyclic vector for R, then it is separating for its commutant. Now, if U is separating for R, then U is in fact, cyclic for R prime. <clears throat> yeah. So how does, is there a slick proof of this? Uh, let's see. So U is cyclic for R prime, that's my claim. If not, let's say R prime of x, so looking at this, so vector in here, 
So the projection onto the space is in fact going to be in R. So projection onto R prime X is contained in R. Simply, you just have to check that it's an invariant subspace, right? Whenever I'm applying T, so, uh, so, so R prime U. So if I, if I have uh, a vector T, then T prime of U is equal to T prime T U. Uh, yeah, so projection onto R prime U is it R? Yeah, I mean, if, if you believe this fact, then what happens is as you, assuming that projection is in R, then if it is separating for uh, uh, and you have U is in here. Does anyone remember a quick proof? Maybe maybe double commutant theorem or uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. So if we use double commutant theorem, but uh so if you assume u is cyclic for r prime, then you can show that uh, u is separating for r. So using double commutant, you'd have the following. If u is cyclic for r prime, then u is separating for r. But I, I, I want to prove this converse, that if u is separating for r, then u is cyclic for r prime. Uh, Yeah, I mean, these are it's definitely belong to R, I'm pretty sure. And if it does, then what? Sorry, uh, what's the question? Yeah. So, so you, you pick a vector, which is? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So if it is not cyclic, uh, cyclic, I'm taking this in uh, H minus this. So this is the span closure of R prime, uh, R prime U. So I'm taking a vector in there. Uh, yeah, I guess you look at the orthogonal complement of that, right, right. So yeah, this is the key step, right? Once you have this E, then I minus E of U equals zero. So if U is separating, then you would have I minus E is zero. So, so essentially all you need to do is prove this projection onto this R prime U is in fact in R. So, I mean, this is in fact true for any vector X, right? Like the, that this projection onto R prime X for any vector X is in fact uh, in R. Yeah, so for this, yeah, I guess maybe Raja was suggesting this to prove this fact using the double commutant theorem. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So this is left invariant by R prime. So this actually belongs to the commutant of R prime. Right, right. Perfect. Yeah. So that works out. So this projection E, E in fact commutes with, uh, yeah, all, all uh, elements of R prime. Okay. All right, so anyway, in summary, if U is a cyclic and separating vector, for R, then it is a cyclic and separating vector <coughs> for R prime. Okay, so coming back to a case of MNC, what we noticed is this is a cyclic and separating vector. So which means even for its commutant, so the image, whatever, as multiplier operators, we had this image in this GNS representation. So this is a cyclic and separating vector. 
So hence it is also cyclic and separating for its commutant. So, so yeah. So I is cyclic and separating for M A. But instead, if you had the square root of H, of course, in your representation, this is going to be cyclic, but it may not be separating. If H is in fact invertible, so this is cyclic and separating. If H is invertible, so cyclicity anyway, you directly have, but you need invertibility so that this becomes a faithful representation. So uh, having H to be invertible will make this a faithful representation. So faithful representation of M and C. So in a way, when we eventually dig down into the details of Tomita Takesaki theory, we'll be dealing with faithful normal states, which in its genus representation will give you a cyclic and separating vector. Of course, we'll not like we'll have to take care of cases where, for example, a faithful normal state does not exist. For example, if your von Neumann algebra is not countably decomposable, then you have to talk about faithful normal weights and so on. But for now, yeah, you appreciate this idea is that to get a faithful representation, you need a faithful state and that corresponds to H being invertible. And that you could have actually read off from what we wrote here. Now, if you have a multiplier operator, you want actually MA of square root H equals zero. You want to conclude from that, that A equals zero. So square root H better be invertible so that you can have this sort of conclusion. Otherwise, you take some projection onto kernel of um, uh, square root h, then you still have that without the ma being equal to zero. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> so now that we have uh, a cyclic and separating vector, so the thing that we want to prove right now is sma prime sa is contained in ma. And note that since uh, S inverse is equal to S. This is actually S M A S inverse. I can move things around. This is exactly the same as saying S M A S. So this direction we have already proved. Now we want to prove this direction. So again, we'll have to do some computation. So this is a matter of understanding what the Frobenius inner product looks like or with the weight so H, let's say, if you're looking at that case. But uh, the, yeah, uh, the whole point boils down to that. So your question is, is there a condition such that there is a separating vector? Uh, yeah, countably decomposable, yes. Uh, yeah, any, yeah, anytime you have U is a separating state, then if you look at the vector state corresponding to that u, then it has to be like a faithful state, right? Yeah, yeah you need countable decomposability, right? Yeah. Like, like, for example, I can always do direct sum of, like, let's say I have a bunch of countably decomposable von Neumann algebras. I can do a, like an infinite direct sum. And I have... How does a separating state give you a separating vector? What I, I don't under, uh, understand that question. Right. Yeah. Uh, does okay, I see. So your question is if you are countably decomposable, then uh, does that imply there is a there is a separating vector? Mm -hmm. I mean, the general idea would be that you look at cyclic projections. So you take any vector, look at the cyclic projection, then look at its orthogonal complement, then keep doing it using Zahn's lemma. Because it is countably decomposable, you cannot have uh, more than countably many uh, or mutually orthogonal non zero projections, non trivial projections, right? So you keep looking at the cyclic projections. On those cyclic projections, you will have a separating vector, like because you're taking x and you're looking at ex. Uh, sorry, you're looking at rx. So and then looking at those cyclic projections, then what you do is do a standard trick where you write x1 plus x2 over 2 plus x3 over 2 squared and so on. That will look like a separating vector there. So I, I believe it is it is possible to do that. Yeah. So Countable decomposability will guarantee a faithful normal state, right? I think. So. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So I think and... this question is pretty much there. Yeah. Yeah, if that is the case, then there always is a cyclic and separating vector by the genus construction. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, but, but, but I guess the question was that the, you are not really doing the GNS construction, but really on that one, nine, I think the question was about, you have a one nine algebra already on a Hilbert space. If you do a GNS construction, of course, you will get a separating uh, vector if it's faithful. But the question was on or, original thing, do you have a separating vector? So the answer for that, I guess, is using cyclic projections and yeah. if you change it to normal representation, it has a separating vector. Really? Universal representation is massive, right? It need not be contiguity decomposable. So, so yeah, I don't think that, that will work. Using universal normal representation will not work. Okay. But, uh, uh, we can change the representation so that it has a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can always change the representation and force a separating vector. Like, uh, I don't know who uh, mentioned this uh, right now. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, given given a represented one by one algebra, it is not always true that there is a separating vector, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, this is what we want to prove. And again, we'll be using this inner product sort of techniques, but now our inner products is using the Frobenius norm. So okay, let's stare at this. So take A prime. So again, I'm changing my notation. So this R is just this multipliers, MAs. So I have A prime, B prime in here. So what I really want to prove is S A prime S B prime is equal to B prime S A prime S. So effectively, I want to say that if I fix A, A prime, so A prime is fixed and B prime varies over R prime. So effectively, I'm saying that this fixed element of B of H here H being that MNC with Frobenius norm is, is commuting with every B prime. So by the double commutant theorem, if we can, if we can show this, then we would have that S A prime S is in fact already in R. Okay, so that's what we'll set out to prove this fact. So S A prime S B prime, oh, I see. So before I do that, I need to compute something. Okay, yeah. I need to compute the adjoint of S. So let's keep hold this thought. So this is what we really want to prove. But before that, I have to compute the adjoint of S. And again, here we have to be a bit careful because adjoint is now in a different sort of Hilbert space. Okay, so the question is, what is the adjoint of S? Just as a reminder, I'm just saying S is a map from H to H. Uh, and this is a conjugate linear map. If you want to make it a linear map, you'll have to go to the conjugate Hilbert space, either here or there on one of these cases. Okay. <laughs> so in order to find this, we go to MA UVEC uh, TU. So here U is just the identity. I'm just writing it. So this is just the identity in H. So I'm writing it as a U. And T belongs to this commutant. And I know that as I change my T, this will range over all of H, right? Because I, I noticed that U is in fact a cyclic and separating vector for R and also for R prime. So if I vary my T, I'll get anything I like. If I vary my MA, I'll get anything I like. So I'll just choose so that to make my computations easier, I'll, I'll choose such MA and T. Now this, by definition, this is A, this is A star. So I can write it as M A star U P U. And here again, implicitly I have used the fact that M of A star is equal to M A star. That also you can uh, verify, or, or since we are actually trying to be careful, let's, let's verify that. So M A star C B. So these are two vectors in H, right? This you want to say is the same as M A B, which is the same as C A B which is the same as trace of B star A star C. This is what you want to say. But at the same time, what you notice is M A star C B is equal to A star C dot B is equal to trace of B star A star C, the same thing. So these two quantities are in fact equal. So what that tells us is M A star is equal to M of A star. Okay, so with that in mind, Let's uh, follow through our computation. So S of M A, really we got M of A star U, but that is same as M of A whole star. 
So containing that, you have uh, T star U, M A U. So here we are using the fact that T and M A commute. So as T and M A or even M A star, so M A commute and T M A star commute because T is in the commutant. That's how we've chosen things. Okay. So we move this here. And this is uh, the same as M A U T star U complex conjugation. So just writing the first term here. So what we have is S of M A U T of U is equal to this. And how do you compute adjoint of a thing? This is the sort of equation that you write, right? S of something, some vector S of, so it's effectively what you want to say is S of uh, X dot Y is equal to X dot S star Y. But here instead, since this is a conjugate linear map, you have a bar here. So that's what you have set up here. And as you change your A and T, this is in fact true for any A and any T. In fact, let's fix T for any A, this is going to be true. So uh, this is a generic vector in the Hilbert space. So what you have really proved is that S star of T U is equal to T star of U. So, so summarize, so S of M A of U was equal to uh, M A star of U, right? So all you have to do is keep this U and take an adjoint here. Now S star acts on T of U and sends it to T star U. So where T belongs to the commutant. So M A commutant. And note that this is well-defined simply because it's, so what's the only possibility where it's not well-defined that you have a non-zero vector here, which goes to zero. But because this is cyclic and separating for R, it is also separating for R prime. So T star U equals zero implies T star equals zero implies T equals zero. And again, I want to specify is that this star, although the symbol we have used is the same, here T star is as a, as a matrix or whichever way you want to think of it. This S is as a map. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry, correct. Uh, uh, my bad, my bad. So this T star is actually the same. Sorry, I take that back. This T, you are also thinking of as a map from H to H. So this star is the same as S star. It's just the fact that M A star equals M A star. When you're writing this fact, this star and this star are different. So that is something that you have to keep in mind. All right. So we have figured out what S star is. Now let's get back to our computations. So again, we wanted to show that S M A prime S is contained in M A. So for that, we had chosen some A prime, B prime, A prime fixed and B prime was allowed to vary. And this is what we want to prove. <clears throat> now, so S A and let me take B prime of some vector V, not, not that U, some general vector V. And then I'm taking S prime of that U, U is that cyclic and separating vector. Now this is equal to, so you have A prime S, B prime V, and then I move this S to this to get the adjoint. So I get a C prime star U, but I have to remember to put a complex conjugation here because this is not a linear map. So I have to keep track of that. Now I have S B prime V. I move the A prime to the other side. I have A prime star, C prime star, U complex conjugation. Then next again, I will move the S. Once I move the S, this complex conjugation will vanish. So what I'm left with is, what do I have? B prime V. Uh, and this is uh, C prime A prime U. C prime A prime U. Okay, so this was the first expression. For the second, we do a similar computation. So you have B prime S A prime S V dot U. So first, you send it off to B prime star U. Then you apply S. Then what you get is B prime U, but with a complex conjugation. 
then you move this. So you get an A prime star. Oh, did I forget a C somewhere? I think I had a C here. Okay, yeah, I did forget that. Yeah, so I had a, uh, so here I had taken CU because uh, C prime U and uh, because eventually I wanted to vary the C prime and make sure that all vectors are covered on this part at least. So I had C prime here. So I had a B prime star C prime of U. And at this stage, what happens is when S is applied, I get a C prime star B prime U with a complex conjugate. Then I get a A prime star C prime star B prime U with this complex conjugate. Now, when I apply this, I get V dot B prime star C prime A prime U, which you notice if I had gone one step further, I would have written this as V dot B prime star C prime A prime U. So these two expressions are in fact the same. And this is for all C. So what is the conclusion? S A prime S B prime of U um, of V, sorry, C U is equal to B prime S B prime S V C U. This is true for all V in H and all C. So U is fixed. Remember, it's a cyclic and separating vector. And this is true for all C in um, uh, C prime, sorry, C prime in. M A prime. So in conclusion, I, I mean, using the fact that this is cyclic for R prime or M A prime, you have all vectors are covered here. Anyway, here you had a choice of an arbitrary vector. So we have proved our result. So S A prime, S B prime is equal to this. <clears throat> okay. And, and if we had taken a, like a invertible density operator, so you see the proof doesn't really care about what U looks like as long as it is cyclic and separating that that's all that matters. So you don't really need that identity operator. So, so yeah, we have, we have this. So S a prime S belongs to, to M a double commutant, which is the same as M a, which tells me that S M a commutant S is contained in this. So overall conclusion is what S M a S is equal to the commutant. So this is the final conclusion that we reached. So till now we have not really used Gardner's invariance theorem, right? We proved it last time. So what we have shown here is MA is a self-adjoint subspace. MA prime is also a self-adjoint subspace and they are actually similar. And S M A S inverse is equal to M A prime. And so what did uh, the theorem say? So first of all, you look at the polar decomposition of S. So you write it as J to the delta to the half, where delta is equal to S star S. Uh, yeah, delta is equal to S star S. And J is actually a conjugate linear isometry. So here, you typical polar decomposition, you would say something like you have a, a unitary because S is invertible. So you'll have a unitary here and you'll have a, a invertible positive operator here. But instead here, since S is a conjugate linear map, so this delta is still positive, but J is the conjugate linear isometry. And then let me just ex explicitly write out our conclusion from Gardner's invariance theorem. Yeah. So the conclusion was that delta uh, to the Z M A delta to the minus Z is equal to M A. So this was one of the conclusions. And then the other conclusion was that J of M A of J. So you had an A and a B. So this, this unitary in the polar decomposition was implementing the equivalence of this and the commutant. So in fact, it was saying one of the information that you have is the size of M A and its commutant is the same. R and R prime are the same size. Typically, you have some sort of uncertainty principle, what is technically called a coupling constant. Like if your von Neumann algebra is big, your commutant is small. If you think for matrices, there is some sort of conservation law going on. For example, if I look at diagonal matrices, so what is the dimension of this? Dimension of this diagonal is N. What is the dimension of its commutant? Still N, right? 
the product of the dimensions is n squared. Now, if I look at the full matrix algebra, I mean, see what is its commutant? Trivial, right? Dimension is n squared. Commutant has like one dimension. So n squared times one. In fact, if you take any any one of any let's say star close subalgebra of MNC and look at its commutant, if you multiply the dimensions of those two, they will be bounded below by n squared. So there is some sort of conservation law there. But yeah, but here here it is saying that we have hit the sweet spot. So effectively, commutant and itself are actually like um, iso I, I, like iso uh, like conjugate linear isomorphic. I would say anti-isomorphic. The term they use is anti-isomorphic. So they're anti-isomorphic to each other. So R and R prime are anti-isomorphic. So this is actually, we have literally kind of stated Tomita's first theorem. So this is Tomita's theorem. And especially in the case where Z is equal to IT, you have a one parameter family of automorphism. Let's just write it as alpha T of A is equal to delta IT a of delta minus it and we know that alpha t becomes a map from r to r thought of it this way it becomes a map from r to r and it's a one parameter group in fact continuous one parameter group of star automorphisms like i said it's actually a two parameter group of inner automorphisms uh, just that um, like the other direction, you don't get star preserving. You, you don't get that the star operation is preserved. Okay. <clears throat> so now with this, so I just wanted to note a few things about S because these all of these players, and right now we're just introducing the characters. We have not really dived into the hard part of Tomita Takesaki theory. Because once we start talking about, like generally now you have an impression that you should care about if you have a one diamond algebra R and U is a cyclic and separating vector, then you kind of have a sense of what this operator S is. So S, first of all, is a map from the Hilbert space H to H. I mean, with some quotation mark, which will be clear now, you're defining S of uh, T of u to be T star of u, right? This is exactly how you're defining S of T of u. And then S star, I'm being very, very loose here, of T prime of u, where T prime belongs to the commutant. T belongs to R, T prime belongs to this. So these are all well-defined operations, but they're actually defined on a dense subset. T u is not the whole of H. S is actually has been defined on a dense subset. So S and S star, in fact, a lot of abuse of notation is going on here. In fact, I should not have called this S star. I should have called it something like an F. I'm just defining a map. Whether What is the connection between these two has to be established. In what sense and so on, that has to be established. But I'm abusing notation and just trying to make the connections of what is very naturally you are able to see in the matrix case, trying to make the connection there. But uh, like I said, eventually we'll do all of this rigorously once we have done the unbounded operator theory carefully. Anyway, so these are the... The maps that will define S and S star are densely defined. And in fact, if you have these, uh, these will be like, you can close them up. These will be closed operators. In fact, that also needs a proof. And once you do that, what you notice is that one, you have a polar decomposition there. There you'll have a unitary polar decomposition. So S may not be invertible in a bounded sense, but it is still somewhat invertible. Like uh, like zero is for example not an eigenvalue there. Okay, so these are and all of the difficulties of what Gardner's invariance theorem that we did, uh, like talking about uh, uh, similarity of self ordered subspaces implies unitary similarity. Doing all that will take a lot of effort. So so that's where the unbounded operator theory makes an entrance. Okay, but for now we are happy to continue on with knowing the key theorems, uh, the key initial theorems of Tomita Takesaki theory. So first is this Tomita theorem about this one parameter automorphism of R and this anti-isomorphism between R and its commutant in the presence of a cyclic and separating vector. Or as we have been saying, if you have a faithful normal state, then of course the GNS representation corresponding to U, so GNS representation corresponding to omega, 
uh, as a cyclic and separating vector. I mean, in fact, uh, the ve corresponding vector state, whatever vector you take, also is a separating vector because of this faithfulness. All right. So, so let's play around with this SS. Look at some properties of this map S, which is going to, which has already shown a lot of potential, which is what we used to implement this um, similarity between um, R and R prime. So let's explore it a little bit more. So S we wrote as delta to the half, where delta is equal to S star S. Yeah. And this is the positive part, and this is the conjugate linear asymmetry. Now G inverse is in fact equal to J star. So why is that? And that will follow from the fact that S inverse is equal to S. Remember, we had shown that S inverse is in like uh, S is its own inverse because the involution operation is its own inverse. So if I look at S inverse, I get something like delta to the minus half, J to the minus one, right? Taking inverses. But if I do polar decomposition of an invertible thing, then there are two ways of doing it. So I can I, either I can write it as S equals J, S star S to the half, or I can write S star to the half, but I always end up with the same J. The unitary I get is the same. This S star S becomes S star, so the unitary I get is the same. Now, when I'm looking at S inverse, so what am I getting? If you, if you look at this, so S inverse is supposed to be delta to the minus half J inverse. And delta to the minus one is what? So delta to the minus one is S inverse star, which is S at star. So delta inverse is just this. So you do have S S star to the half J inverse here, which is the same as S S star to the half J, which is what we noticed here. So that means J is equal to J inverse. So that is one observation that J is also equal to, since S is equal to S inverse, J is equal to J inverse. Okay. So this is equal to delta to the minus half J. Like I said, using the fact that S equals S inverse, you typically demand that delta to the minus half J inverse, but then because of uniqueness of polar decomposition, um, you have um, this J inverse can be replaced by a J. Okay. Now here's a proposition. We'll revisit all these propositions once we have done like uh, modular theory carefully. But right now you have a glimpse of all these propositions that we're going to see. So summarizing all of it, there is a conjugate linear isometric mapping J and an invertible positive operator in B of H here, remember H is that MNC. That's the H I'm talking about, MNC and so on. Either taking the Frobenius norm or taking this invertible density operator corresponding um, genus uh, inner product. Okay, so let's say you have this, there is a conjugate linear isometric mapping J and an invertible positive operator delta in B of H such that, so these are the properties that I want to note down more carefully. First of all, delta is S star S, delta inverse is S S star, and J square is equal to identity. Secondly, S is equal to delta J times delta to the half is equal to delta to the minus half times J. Then third, S star is delta to the half times J. You take star here, delta is positive, that's fine. Now, when you take J star here, J star is J inverse, which is the same as J. And similarly, here you have delta to the half, uh, sorry, J times delta to the minus half. And number four, 
is j of delta to the i t is equal to delta to the minus i t of j for all t. And then instead of writing it the next page, number five, I'm just going to mention is j of u, u was that cyclic and separating vector is equal to delta of u is equal to u. So j lives u invariant. So that you can just read off from the definition because how is s defined on u? Is the identity acting on you, right? If you remember S of U, you can think of as S of identity of U. So this is clearly just you. You take I star acting on you, that is just you itself. And once you have that, uh, so let's so once you have uh, so delta U is equal to S star S, right? And the same holds also for S star. How is S star defined? You just think of identity as being an element of the commutant. So in this case, you're thinking of, of identity operator as being an element of the one dimensional algebra. So then you have S star of U. Now think of U as I times U, where I is in the commutant. So then again, you get U. So you have delta of U is this, so which implies delta square U is this, blah, blah, blah. Any polynomial you take in delta acting on U, um, I mean, as long as you're not taking the zero polynomial or something, then this you, you, you get uh, P of, oh no, I shouldn't. Let me just, uh, you'll have to sum all the coefficients in that case. So let me just write it as delta to the N U. Then of course, square root delta. So you have square root of delta is equal to u and j of square root delta is equal to j of u simply because this is true. And this by definition is s of u, which is u. So overall, what, do you, what have we concluded? You have concluded that j u is equal to u. So j also leaves u uh, alone. So this step, let, let's think about it a bit. So I'm saying that square root delta u is equal to u and I'm approximating using some polynomials. Uh, so how does that work? So if I evaluate that polynomial at, uh... oh yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right. So if you have, yeah, so I can just write P delta of U is P of one times U. So that's what you have. So as you approximate, you only end up square root delta u is equal to square root of one times u. So that's what you get, right? Okay, so this part is fine. So what we have done is anyway, one, two, and three are just moving things around. So part number five, we have proved. So let's do a, a quick proof of uh, part number four. Although in the Gardner's theorem, you already had sense of this, right? When you had, um, uh, so you have j delta half is equal to delta to the minus half. It's just that you have to do some sort of analytic continuation of this fact. So uh, if you repeatedly use this, you multiply delta to the half, use these identities, you get j delta to the t is equal to delta to the t times j. And this is true for any t. Uh, uh, yeah. So in other words, this fact will be fine, delta to the minus t. So yeah, so let's try to prove number four. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Actually, this is an error. So that, that's why I was wondering, here you don't have this. Just it. Here you have j delta to the it and the same delta to the it, not minus it. Here you have delta to the half and delta to the minus half. So typically what you're saying is in fact, if you have a complex number z here, the, it's the real part. Maybe you, maybe the complex number I want to call it i z. So it's the real part I want to make negative. The complex part I'll, I'll just leave alone. Then this inequality will still hold. So, so combining both cases, how, how should we phrase it? So we say delta to the z is equal to something like this. You take i z, take its conjugate, and then write i. So this is true for all Z in C. All right, the proof will be using 
some sort of uh, function calculus and spectral theorem. So delta inverse, you already have j delta j simply because you have j delta to the half is delta to the minus half j. Uh, so from here, is it clear? So this is the same as s. So I'm, I'm looking at s s star, which is exactly this expression. Yeah, and s star is delta inverse. Yeah, so th this is just that expression. So delta inverse, I know to be j delta j, which again, because j equals j inverse is equal to j star, you have, I can write it in this manner. Now delta, remember, is a positive operator. So I have a spectral decomposition in some sense. Now in that spectral projections, I can do this conjugation. So in a way, I can think of it as integral lambda d of j e lambda j star. So delta, if I write as if delta is integral lambda d e lambda, here, of course, integral just means a sum if you're dealing with finite dimensional things. OK. <clears throat> so if I look at any function of delta inverse and an expression of this form, so what do I get? I didn't even need to do this. I mean, anyway, we are not being very precise. So why even bother with looking at all this strong operator topology and so on. So f of delta inverse, so if it's a nice enough function, I can make it act on this lambda. So this I will just think of as f of lambda d of g j e lambda j star. <coughs> All right, so maybe there is some sense in looking at this expression. Okay, so F E lambda, and you are looking at X dot X here. Now here, F lambda, I move the J to the other side. So I have J X, uh, e lambda j x. So j is equal to j star. So I, I, I like maybe I'll just think of this as j star and this as a j. So I move the j here uh, to get a j again and e lambda here. So I get e lambda j x. This is same as integral f lambda d of e lambda j x of x. Oh, yeah, sorry. This x I should replace with that cyclic and separating vector. That would be the whole point. U dot u. So here I have a u, here I have a u. Okay. No, but then okay, so you have j x j e lambda x. So this is a real, yeah, this is real simply because, yeah, sorry, I take that back. It's not just the that uh, the cyclic and separating vector u, you're just taking an arbitrary vector x. If you're writing this, and then noting that e lambda is in fact uh, orthogonal projection. This think of this as just some vector v or whatever, then I can actually move things around because it's a real number. So I can write the same as e lambda jx dot jx. So this is the same as f of delta jx jx. Okay, so the key fact that we used here was um, 
yeah, I mean, E lambda is just a self forgery thing. So then Jx bar. So if you are familiar with your, like uh, careful with your function calculus, F is a complex valued function. The adjoint of this is essentially the F bar acting on delta. So this is nothing but the function F bar acting on this positive operator delta, right? So this is the same as F of delta adjoint. Okay. So what have we concluded? This is true for any vector, right? So we had F delta inverse X dot X is equal. Oh, by the way, again, the next step, I'll move the J. So I have J F delta bar J X. So this means But I want to really have the right hand term on the other side. So well, uh, you maybe need to put a bar because J is anti linear when you are moving. Yeah, yeah, J, yeah, exactly. Side. Yeah, exactly. Whenever I'm moving a J, I have to put a bar. Exactly. That's right. So that's why we have to be very careful. So, we, yeah, so here I have to put a bar simply because J is anti linear. And when I'm taking the adjoint, so this is equal to J of F delta, F delta bar. J X X. So comparing these two expressions, what we have is F of delta inverse is equal to J of F delta bar J. So now you put in your favorite complex function. For example, if I put in F Z uh, equals E to the Z or something, then I have delta to the minus Z is equal to uh, E to the minus Z bar. Oh, sorry, delta to the minus Z star j <clears throat> or or in fact it could be the function e to the it like so on the real line let's say i define the function t goes to e to the it then what i have is, is delta to the minus it here then again i have delta to the it bar which is the same as delta to the minus it so this inverse and bar like work out to be the same is uh, on the unit circle that right? Z bar is the same as, so Z bar is equal to Z inverse on the unit circle on S1. So using that fact, and of course, T, T I can always take to be negative. This is in fact a map from R2. So I'm taking a R value function. So I can take T to be negative also. Uh, sorry, I mean T to E to the minus IT. For example, I could do that. And then using the fact that J is equal to J inverse, I move it to the other side. So I have all these five. So maybe we can stare at it for a bit. So there is, so given a one name algebra R with a cyclic and separating vector U, we defined these maps S and S star without stressing too much on the connection between S and S star. Although in the case of matrices, we saw exactly the, the adjoint of each other. Uh, okay. So then when you did the polar decomposition, into this uh, conjugate linear map J and this uh, positive part delta, invertible positive operator, then you, you had all these properties that J commuted with uh, commutes with delta to the IT for any, uh, uh, yeah, any real T for all T in R, I should say here. Okay. And then this cyclic and separating vector is left uh, alone by uh, J and delta. Okay. So next, I want to talk about the KMS condition. Actually, maybe next time also, uh, yeah, we'll elaborate a bit more on the physics of the case KMS condition. Right now, we just want to get to the, the, the key aspects of, at least the key initial aspects of uh, the modular theory. So here's a quick definition. So let's say alpha t from a von Neumann algebra R to R is a one parameter group. of star automorphisms. <clears throat> so, uh, so then R is said to satisfy 
the modular condition or, or rather I should say alpha t. Alpha t is said to satisfy the modular condition relative to a state omega of r r if given a b in r you have a complex function there is a complex function f f defined on this strip so this is a strip where the real part of z is equal to 0 uh, sorry imaginary part is equal to 0 and here this is imaginary part is equal to 1 so you have this function which is analytic so here so complex function f on the strip below so whose definition you can think of as all those z's as that imaginary part is in between zero and one and both included. <clears throat> so yeah, so there is a complex function f such that f is analytic in the interior and continuous on the whole domain in the interior and continuous bounded on the whole thing on the whole strip the key thing and satisfies so the modular condition will be given so i have to move to the next page and satisfies f plus f of t plus i is equal to omega b alpha t a and f of t is equal to omega alpha of t a b so effectively if this was a trivial automorphism group and so this is like a portal you can think of as this uh, as some sort of portal and it is trying to capture the tracialness of a state so for example if you are a tracial state then these two are equal right you have a complex function which is actually the value here is the same as here but here you 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 started off with maybe any state and if through this like um, uh, so corresponding to this automorphism group you have this like sort of portal as you transition from here to here you are able to twist this term so here you have alpha t of a times b and here you have b times alpha t of a when you evaluate this i'm not saying that the values are the same but there is some sort of way of analytically continuing from the values here to the values here so so that is that is the meaning of so let me repeat so given a one parameter group of a star automorphism of this von neumann algebra then this one parameter group is said to satisfy the modular condition or the kms condition at what is called uh, KMS at beta equals minus one is said to satisfy this condition relative to the state omega if there is a complex valued function f which at one end is carrying the value of omega alpha t of a, uh, alpha t of a times b b is fixed you are just moving a around so at one side it is containing this value on the other side it is containing omega b uh, like replacing uh, or, or interchanging the order and then in between you are able to analytically continue this function okay and of course this has definitely some connection with um, like whatever automorphism groups we have been talking about so let me state that theorem so theorem so this automorphism group from r to r given by alpha t of a sorry so if you if you have a like so if you have two functions then they have to be both zero on the boundary right if you take the difference so the question was is this f unique and the answer is yes because if the, uh, if you have two functions then it is zero on the boundary then you can do a reflection and you can extend to whole whole plane to form an so uh, to in order to show that this reflection works out we will prove a small lemma i mean anyway already from complex analysis you already be well aware then you will use Liouville's theorem to conclude it has to be the constant function zero Okay, so yeah, so we do have a very special class of automorphism groups in mind, right? So this alpha t of this, this uh, was related to uh, like here it is kind of inverse, like first you start with a one parameter automorphism group, then you are saying, okay, it has this 
um, it satisfies this modular condition relative to omega if something happens, right? But here we actually start with the state omega, right? So in the discussion that we're having, we started with omega, we did a GNS construction. Omega was a faithful normal state. Like when H was a density operator, which was invertible, you had a faithful representation. Um, and the, then you got the cyclic and separating vector. Based on that, we built this S, I, S and then you got this J and delta and so on. So you started with this omega. Then you got this one parameter automorphism rooms. So the assertion of this theorem is that alpha of t satisfies the modular condition relative to omega. If omega was a tritial state, then in fact, uh, so what you will have is. Uh, Yeah, so you'll have omega alpha. T. Yeah, so both of these sides will be equal. So if omega is a tritial state, then I mean, you will get uh, some sort of trivial automorphisms. No, so yeah, just give me a second. Let me think about this. So if... Yeah, that's right. So in fact, that is also one of the propositions that we're going to prove. So if omega is already tracial, that means omega a h is equal to omega h a for all a in R and b in R, then what you have is alpha t of a is equal to a for all t. So if you started with a tracial state, you don't really get any interesting thing out of it. Okay. So uh, all you're saying here is trace of AB is equal to trace of B. So you're getting some sort of constant function and you're saying trace of AB is equal to trace of B. So constant across this line. Okay, so this is the theorem that we want to prove that corresponding to the state we started off with, the faithful normal state that we started off with, and uh, the, uh, the automorphism, the one parameter automorphism, group, star automorphism group that we got, it satisfies the modular condition. So here's a quick lemma. So we'll have to do some gluing. So we need this gluing lemma. So suppose you have two such strips. So A less than B less than C, though this will determine a strip, this will determine a strip, put them together, you get a bigger strip. And F is a complex valued function. That is bounded and continuous. on this strip given by A less than equal to imaginary part of Z. So it's just, uh, so essentially if you have A here, you have C here and B somewhere in the middle. So it's a full strip. So F is a complex valued function that is bounded and continuous on the full strip, but it is analytic on these two parts. And is analytic on let's say omega one, which is Z belongs to C, uh, A strictly less than imaginary part of Z, strictly less than B and omega two. So separately on these two like open strips, it is analytic and it is continuous and bounded on the whole thing. B less than imaginary part of Z less than C. Then F is analytic on the strip, it's the interior of the bigger strip, omega three, which is A strictly less than imaginary part of Z, strictly less than C. Okay, so this is the lemma, the gluing lemma. So, and the way you do it is use Cauchy's residue theorem, the right manner. Can you please just repeat that statement again? The statement is, uh, so you have A, B, and C. So you have A here, B here, C here. These are real numbers. If you, you have a function which is continuous and bounded on the whole strip, including the boundary points. So forget about the middle line. It is just continuous and bounded on the whole thing. And what information that you have is on this open part. And on this open part, it is analytic. So we don't know what happens in this middle B line. So in this part, it is analytic. In this part, it is analytic. Then the conclusion is that actually this, Middle line poses no issues. You can actually analytically continue it over that. So in this whole strip, in this whole strip, uh, it is in fact analytic. 
And of course, by choice, it is already continuous and bounded on the closed strip. Uh, so is that clear? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so the proof, you just pick some, so the, let's say zero is somewhere here and just translate this uh, ABC appropriately. So let's say this is minus R and there is a plus R. So of course you can imagine eventually we are going to work with work locally. We start with some R, then we send R off to infinity. That is fine because the analytic set is a local concept. Okay. So now, uh, so let me call, so now just like I had omega one, omega two, omega three, now I have three rectangles. Let me call it R1, R2, and this whole thing, let me call R3. So the only difference between omega one, R1 is just that you're truncating at minus R to R. There it consists of, of the whole strip. So just look at this contour integral. F of Z is equal to uh, one over two pi I contour integral over gamma of three. So si similarly being consistent with this notation, gamma of three is just this boundary. F of uh, W divided by Z minus W DW. So this is an analytic function. So here, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just looking at the integral on the boundary simply because Z minus W is an analytic function whenever I'm taking Z inside here. So that is a basic theorem. But then I can split this integral into two contour integrals, one uh, in the smaller rectangle and in the bigger rectangle. Now, if Z belongs to R1, then f of z, I can write as one over two pi i integral over gamma one, I'm just splitting up into two parts. Oh, by the way, I should have written omega minus z here. Omega minus z here. So fw divided by omega minus z dz plus one over two pi i integral over gamma of two. Okay. So now here Z is in R1, right? So here you do have uh, like for this function, you have some sort of residue, you have uh, like pole of order one, right? And here using Cauchy residue theorem, you know that this is in fact equal to F of Z. And here, because this is analytic actually, in the, in the interior, you don't have any poles or anything like that. You get a zero out of this. So F of Z in fact matches up with this. So first of all, F you noted that is an analytic function. Then it is matching up with F on R1 on interior R1, let's say, on interior R1. And similarly, it is equal to this in interior R2 also. Okay. But then it is also given that it is a continuous function, right? So that means F is equal to F on R3 as both are continuous. So yeah, so, the, the, so you conclude that already F is an analytic function. Okay. So I have five minutes. So let's see if I can finish the proof of this fact. So just the fact that we're going to use is this map, complex number Z going to delta to the Z. Remember delta is a positive invertible operator. So this map is bounded, continuous, and analytic in the interior. So you can think of this in the weak sense also. Either you can think of it as like, I'm talking about holomorphic or Banach space valued functions or something like that. Or you can just say this map for any vectors X and Y, this is true. So now this is the honest to goodness complex valued function sense. So whichever way you want to think of it, especially when we talk about, talk about one Neumann algebras, we would like to think of it in the latter sense, because it's a little bit harder. Here you would call it weak holomorphicity, something like that. Like for any functional, when we apply on that, I get a complex or, or an analytic function out of it. So, yeah. So, uh, so again, let me restate the theorem. You have this is equal to this. This is the one parameter automorphism group. This corresponds to omega. Then this alpha t satisfies the modular condition relative to omega.
here's a quick sketch of the proof. So anyway, we had seen that delta of u is u. You just do function calculus, same story. You get delta of minus it u equals u for all t in R. Then look at this omega u of sigma t a of b. So omega u is just the vector state corresponding to u. So this is, I'm just writing out explicitly the definition. B u dot u. Now I have this is delta to the minus i t b u. I move things around, take adjoints. So I get a star delta to the minus u t u. But this is equal to u. So this is exactly a star u. So one part, one part of the complex line. So it's eventually we'll prove that in between, like you are able to uh, build an analytic function. So this is evaluating one side. For the other side, you have B alpha T A. Again, I'm just writing out the definition. That's all. Delta to the minus I T U dot U. So this is delta to the I T A. Here also I'm noting that delta to the minus I T U is U. So delta to the I T A U. B star U. So somehow A and B have been exchanged. So if you notice in this case, you have an A star on the right and a B in here. Here you have a B star on the right and an A in here. Okay. <clears throat> now define this function. So we are going to use the drawing lemma now. So B U A star U and H of Z is equal to Delta of one plus I Z. A u b star of u. Okay, so this is bounded continuous. All those functions are bounded and continuous on the strip. Simply because here, um, by the way, here i z. I don't want this z to be complex numbers. So maybe I just want to say. No, I, I do I do want that. But yeah, but yeah, so the whole point, the reason it is bounded is anyway, these are going to be um, bounded elements. And uh, this this quantity, this is on the strip, right? It's on Z, it belongs to uh, what sort of strip? So here, imaginary part of Z is between zero and a half. Here it is between half under one. So in this case, so it should be clear that this is a bounded operator. So what do we have here? Imaginary part is bounded. So when I multiply I, the imaginary part becomes the real part. Yeah, right. So because we want this to be a bounded operator. So the point is when I have I times Z, since imaginary part is bounded, I times Z, only the real part can cause issues. If it if it is unbounded, then delta to the r could be an unbounded operator. But here, since we have imaginary part is bounded between zero and a half, doesn't matter what the bounds are, as long as it is bounded, this is a bounded operator. So this is bounded and continuous on the strip. Okay. So now let's look at what is g of p e plus half i. So just look at the definition g of t. Uh, so replacing z by t plus half i. So I get minus i t delta to the half b u a star u. Now I put a j here. j square is identity. Now j of delta half is s. So what you end up with is delta to the minus i t b star u here. A star u. Yeah. So J. Yeah, right. So now think of this 
So maybe think of this instead of A star, you think of it as SAU, forget this star. Yeah, so simultaneously we applied S to BU and kind of unapplied S to this thing. So SAU. Uh, so now we have J of delta to the minus IT because these two commute. Oh, by the way, I forgot the J here. So we had shown that delta to the minus ITJ is equal to J delta to the minus IT. Sorry, so give me just two more minutes. I'll wrap it up. So SA is again J delta to the half AU. Now this is equal to delta to the half AU because using the fact that it's a conjugate linear isometry. So I like if it were just an isometry, I could remove the J from both sides, but here I have to move things around. So delta to the half AU, and I have a delta to the minus IT V star U. But let's look at the expression of H of T plus half I. You see, there's a AU here and a V star U here. So this is equal to delta half plus IT AU V star U, which is H of T plus half I. So overall, we are able to glue these functions. So glue these functions G and H to get F, so what happens at the endpoints? What is f of t plus i? So g of uh, so f of t is equal to g of t, which is omega u sigma uh, alpha t of a times b, and f of t plus i is equal to h of t plus i, which is uh, sorry h h of t plus half i, which is equal to omega u. B sigma T H. So yeah, so we, we have shown that maybe we'll very quickly revisit it in the beginning of the next class. So we have proved that, uh, that this one parameter group of automorphism that you have satisfies um, the modular condition relative to the omega, which gave rise to this one parameter automorphism group. Okay, so any, any questions, quick questions? Yeah, I have one question. Yeah. So when you do this uh, Tomita Takasaki theory on um, uh, matrices, so uh -huh. we also want to say that whether like, historically the Tomita Takasaki theory comes up in this way. No, 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 no. I, I don't. Uh, so, so your question is uh, whether historically Tomita Takasaki theory comes through matrices. Is that your question? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or like no, 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 when no. Tomita was doing this, like, and uh, later on Takasaki was brewing those results. Like whether Tomita was doing all these on matrices or what? So historically, the story I have heard is that it was just a bolt out of the blue. Like in the sense, no one had any idea that such a like um, thing could work. So it was kind of like that. So what I am following is I'm just trying to give plausibility arguments. Like for example, the Gardner's invariance theorem that kind of gives you a sense as to like to expect a one parameter automorphism group as long once you have a similarity and so on. So I'm trying to make it feel a little bit uh, natural. Because otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a very, uh, it looks very complicated, like magic. So okay. it is all my own personal motivation, not historical motivation. Okay, okay. But the, the point one has to note here is, uh, although uh, the, uh, up to this, the results you are getting from matrices are actually non-trivial results. In the sense, it's not giving you some, uh, like, uh, like trivial, autom like if it's a tracial state, you get trivial automorphism groups. But if you have a, a non-trivial state, then it will give you non-trivial things. But when you come to the structure theory, when you come to the structure theory, I, one of the key goals of this course is to say that every type three factor is a cross product of a type two infinity with some one parameter automorphism group. So when you want to describe the, those structures, then in the matrix case or even in the type two one, type two infinity, Tomita Takasaki theory will not say much. In fact, that is a theorem that will prove that it won't be able to say much because all these automorphism groups will be inner automorphisms with for example, this delta doesn't necessarily come from, delta need not come from R. In fact, it's an unbounded operator, typically. It may not be affiliated with R. So maybe I should say delta may not be affiliated with R. But when you have semi-finite von Neumann algebras, like type two infinity, then you can in fact choose delta to be affiliated with R. And you will get some sort of inner automorphisms. And uh, uh, yeah, and, and the theory is, is not like, um, 
like you could have gotten that theory from any other means. Like you already know that, uh, for example, matrices, all automorphisms are inner automorphisms. Based on that, you could have built up your another theory. But, uh, but if you really care about the structure theory uh, of type three factors, that is when the full power comes in, the cone co-cycle derivatives and comparison of different states um, and so on. That's when the full power uh, like uh, blooms. Okay, any other questions? All right, so if not, again, we'll see uh, each other next week, Wednesday. So we'll begin with this discussion. And maybe hopefully by the end of next lecture, we'll actually start doing really, really serious mathematics. We'll start talking about unbounded operators and uh, what the affiliation means and, and, and those things. And then eventually come back and do a very clean uh, treatment of Tomita Takisaki theory without making simplifying assumptions. Okay, see you.